All right, let's go ahead and get started today. And today's Vaughn Company webinar, that's not a digester, how to mix how to mix blend tanks, storage tanks, EQ basins, and more. In this session, we're going to discuss the role and differences between the different tanks and a solids handling process, how these differences impact the design of the mixing system for each, and how to quantify the design requirements when specifying mixing capacity. If you're new to our Vaughn webinars, the best place to uh, ask questions is right there in that Q&A pod in the bottom right hand side of the screen. Those questions will come back and Steve and Eric and uh, the rest of the Vaughn team will catch those. For the most part, we grab them at the end of the webinar and, um, and we'll answer those as much as we go. And then if we don't get to all of them, then uh, Steve, what will we do with the, with the questions? If we uh, if we run out of time, that's a good question. We thought about that. We're going to definitely respond to everyone over email or phone call. So any, anyone who asks a question, it will be answered. All right. So let's uh, let's uh, bring in our, our two presenters today. First of all, we've got senior engineer for Rotomix. That's Eric Larson. Eric's been supporting Vaughn Company customers for wow since 2012. And uh, he has a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from Washington State University. Those cougars over there on the east side of the state and is a frequent mixing and processing topic presenter. Eric, welcome again, buddy. Nice to have you. Thanks for having me. All right, and then to get us started, let's welcome in Vaughn's Rotomix manager, Steve Macomer. Steve's been in the water and wastewater industry, uh, protecting the water environment and public health for over 20 years. Served as a machinist mate in the United States Navy before attending college and grad school at North Carolina State University and the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. Steve, great to have you back here. We appreciate it, and the floor is yours, sir. Glad to be here. Thanks, Scott. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, again, we're back. Uh, very excited to be here. Thanks for joining us if you're new or, or if you're just coming back for the second time for Rotomix. Um, I'd like to just sort of set the table for everyone. Uh, before we start, you know, engineers, we'd love to jump into the details, and, and uh, we can do that right away, and details are important. But I wanted to sort of state the overall purpose of mixing is critical. Um, you know, everyone uh, has their own unique application and we understand that and it's just critical to sort of understand that uh, to start the conversation pointing out that Vaughn has over 2,500 Rotomix installations and we do understand how how each of them are unique there are similarities and you know usually um, mixing in one way or another is a, is a critical process within any process on a global scale um, mixing capital costs operations maintenance costs investments are enormous so, uh, you know, we, along with you, our customers, we need to clearly define each mixing application, the success criteria for it, set the goal so that we can reach it. Um, of course, the cost of either over-engineering or under-engineering is, is very real. It's on the order of a, a billion dollars or more per year. So effective mixing is important. Um, with that, big picture sort of introduction, I'm going to hand things over to our senior product engineer, Eric Larson. All right, thank you, Steve. And we'll just uh, we'll get right into this. Um, so first, I kind of want to talk about uh, you know digesters versus everything else. Um, you know, for many facilities, there are more non-digesters than there are digesters. Um, although digesters tend to get a lot more attention, um, each tank or process has a specific purpose, and the mixing system design should reflect that specific purpose, um, if at all possible. Um, you know, you know, this is kind of a diagram of a, of a general municipal treatment plant. Uh, for those of you that are from uh, other industries, uh, just bear with me here. But I just kind of want to talk about, uh, you know, you've got CSO stations, tunnels on the on the before the headworks. Uh, you know, prior to the treatment facility, you have uh, equalization basins that may be pre-facility or or post uh, uh, the headworks. Uh, you've got uh, anoxic zones, which potentially you're going to see mixing. Um, from Rotomix or other uh, or other process that uh, are also there. You've got sludge blending tanks uh, prior to digestion. You've got digesters, which uh, you know we're really kind of ta talking about today. And then you've got uh, sludge storage tanks. So you can see there's a lot more going on that requires mixing than just digesters. Even though digesters tend to get most of the attention. Um, and just kind of looking at Rotomix applications, um, you know we do anaerobic digester mixing. Egg-shaped digesters are, are a great application for our technology. 
acid phase digesters, uh, secondary digesters, and oxygen mixing. But we also do equalization tanks, lime stabilization for either wastewater or, or water uh, facilities, uh, sludge storage and blend tanks, uh, septage receiving, skimming systems, and uh, influent channels and CSO basins. So these are all uh, applications where we, we regularly see Rotomix be applied. Um, and these here are, are all of the applications that aren't uh, tied to any sort of biological process or, uh, or digestion. Um, and you can see there's, there's quite, a few, um, quite a few applications that, that don't kind of fit that digester mold. And uh, I kind of want to talk about why we kind of separate those out. So first, before we do that, I want to talk about why we mix digesters so we can kind of compare and contrast. So we mix digesters to create a homogeneous digester volume for the biomass. We want to provide consistent pH and temperature and evenly distribute feedstocks. Um, those are all uh, criteria that help to maximize efficiency of the biological process, make sure the biomass is converting all of that uh, total, that volatile solid into biogas as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. And you also want to mix a digester to reduce deposition and loss of digester volume um, to maintain the, the capacity of that process and uh, make sure that what goes in comes out. Um, because it is it is a waste stream process, um, and you don't want to you don't want to be capturing waste in that system. Um, but with that, uh, you know, digesters are biological processes, and I think the biological process and the needs of that process get a lot of attention. Um, but for everything that isn't a digester, they're physical processes. So you're not trying to maintain a biomass or maintain some sort of suspended growth process. What you're really trying to do is you're trying to meet the physical needs of, of whatever that tank's process is, whether it's storage, blending, um, whether it's um, just a, an equalization basin or, or fluids moving through it. it. It's going to have requirements that need to be met, and most of those are going to be based on physical needs. Um, so there are really only two goals of mixing for physical process, and I think this is a good way to break it out. Um, you have mixing to blend or homogenize, so you're taking two separate uh, fluids, you're taking two different sludges, um, whatever it is, you're taking two different species and, and mixing them together to form a cohesive homogeneous uh, mixture that you're then pushing to another process, whether it's um, further treatment, dewatering, what have you. Um, and so that's, that's one typical process. The other one is to suspend or agitate. So this is, um, you know, a single uh, mixed tank, um, you know, everything's been homogenized and you're just trying to keep it from restratifying. You're trying to keep things from settling out. You're trying to keep grit from settling, um, just resuspending and agitating this fluid to keep it from, uh, from coming out of suspension. Um, you know, mixing designed for individual processes will balance these two. So you're not going to necessarily see all one or all the other generally. You're going to see some mixture of we need mixing to blend and homogenize the things that are going in, but we also need mixing to, to keep it in suspension and keep it agitated. And these two things are, are have different energy requirements attached to them, and they're really going to kind of tug and pull against each other to, to, to try to find an efficient mixing design. Um, so before we get in too much to individual processes, I'm going to talk a little bit about what Rotomix is and, and what, uh, what Rotomix can offer. Uh, hydraulic mix, it's a hydraulic mixing system using fixed nozzles and an external Vaughn chopper pump. Um, and that's really the, the key to Rotomix is, is using that, that pump, which is able to handle solids and, and chop down all those solids in the process, and use that to pump through nozzles that then provide um, grid of energy transfer to help drive mixing in these tanks. Um, Rotomix system design, we can uh, distribute flow for customized uh, process geometry. Um, and cylindrical tanks are the most efficient, but we can mix rectangular basins and other geometries. And I think that just is in general a cylindrical tank with being um, being uh, perfect symmetry tends to lend to good energy efficiency and transfer. Um, but rectangular basins and other geometries can can, tech, can sometimes uh, provide better um, better shear and better turbulence, which is going to which is going to agitate more um, at a cost of energy. Uh, so. You know, depending on what the process is, uh, you know, we get into different geometries and, and we're able to do this. There's a uh, CFD analysis, uh, you can see the picture there, where an old clarifier was uh, transitioned to be a sludge storage tank um, because of needs, changing needs of a facility and, and wanting to save money on that existing capital. And while that was a very, very challenging geometry to provide uh, consistent mixing across the entire volume, 
um, it is something that we're able to design for and that actually took quite a bit of work and, and revision uh, to make sure that we were providing a, a mixing system that met the needs of the process um, if, and provided that level of mixing necessary for that uh, for that tank. Um, the key is really even distribution of, of mixing through multiple discharge points and that's really the value of uh, the, the Vaughn Rotomix systems being able to take a single momentum source through the pump and drive that through various uh, nozzles that are located in different areas um, to help distribute that energy and make sure that it's helping to drive that bulk mass and produce that mixing flow that we're looking for. Um, and we're able to focus mixing on individual regions, which really isn't a value for, for digesters necessarily, um, although we have other values for digesters. But, um, you know, for, you know, different process tanks where you might have re certain regions that you're trying to mix very aggressively and other regions that you're not very uh, concerned about mixing for, uh, you can really drive down your energy costs and, and, and still maximize process efficiency by, by focusing the mixing to, re to different regions um, and, and not wasting energy in areas where you don't need it. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about what processes we're going to be looking at today. Um, first, I'm going to start out with lift stations and, and talk a little bit about that. Then we'll move on to CSO basins, uh, EQ basins. We'll talk a little bit about fog, high strength waste, and septage receiving, uh, sludge blend tanks, and then finally sludge storage tanks. And for those of you in uh, the industrial and ag markets, um, whether you're owners, operators, or, or anywhere in between, um, you know, a lot of this information about municipal treatment is going to be very applicable to your waste streams and your facilities, um, whether you're a, uh, an agricultural farm that has either a manure pit or some other holding tank that you're then either land applying or sending off to further treatment, um, or you're an industrial uh, factory that has a waste stream that you're detaining and storing or, or otherwise uh, putting in a condition where you need to maintain mixing. So, um, you know, while this is going to be very municipal focused, a lot of this information is very transferable to other processes and, and other applications. So. Um, just bear with me. I think the municipal, though, really provides the best backdrop um, for going through the various different types of process because um, in municipal, you tend to see a little bit of everything. Um, so lift stations, I think lift stations don't necessarily always get considered um, for, for mixing, but, uh, you know, more and more we're starting to see lift stations uh, be an important thing. And uh, if you were joined us for our uh, WIPES presentation uh, so about a month ago, um, you would have gotten a lot of great information about what we can offer for lift stations, but I'm just going to touch back on it uh, pretty quickly. So some lift stations may require mixing for reliable operation. You know, lift stations are not all the same. Um, you're going to have different different communities, different neighborhoods, different uh, mixes of residential, commercial, um, maybe some industrial uh, residents that are that are discharging directly to the uh, to the sewer system. Uh, so you can definitely, or it could be a private lift station that uh, where you where you know what you're you're sending in, and it's and it's not what typically you'd see in a lift station. Um, you know these all can change uh, lift station design, and and really uh, mixing can help solve alleviate a lot of the problems that are generally faced. Uh, you know floating mats and grease can create problems for large non-clog pumps, and uh, you know it requires rapid mixing and turnover. Uh, because, you know, flow is coming in and moving out of the lift station fairly quickly. The, the hydraulic retention time in, in a lift station is generally not very long. And so you need to have rapid mixing and turnover uh, to keep up with, uh, with the loading that you might be seeing and to manage that. Um, so we'll look at it a couple, a couple alternatives. For smaller stations, uh, Vaughn recirculators are offered in both uh, vertical and submersible configurations. And these can be used uh, for small, uh, small stations and drop-in stations. Um, you know, and it, with a pretty reliable application for us. Uh, acts as both the recirculation mixer and the lift pump. So you can provide a, a certain time of recirculation mixing to, to agitate and bring everything into suspension. And then you can switch to pump out and pump the, the fluid out of the lift station uh, on your normal, as an, in normal operation of a lift station. Um, it can be installed as a duplex station with a single recirculator. So you can have your redundancy of two pumps and have one of them have a recirculator. So the recirculation pump is running constantly and the other pump is constantly discharging uh, when you have a high flow period. And then you can drop down to cycles between uh, recirculation and, mix and, and pump out when you're in your low flow stages. And you also still have that built-in redundancy that's necessary for many stations uh, 
so that you, uh, you're always online, especially when you're needed. Uh, so that's, that's something that really can be a really efficient uh, thing for, for many uh, facilities and collection systems. We typically design for six turnovers per hour. We found that to be um, a good working, working in between of not over designing the flow, but still making sure it's, it's robust enough that uh, it can handle anything you throw at it. Um, so six turnovers per hour is, is generally our design there. And for, uh, for most list stations, that's gonna be a fairly reasonable flow rate um, for, for being able to provide uh, the mixing that's necessary. Um, the other option that we have for larger lift stations, um, and this is going to be where you generally will see some very, very large um, installed uh, non-clogs, uh, you know, high flow, uh, just central collection stations or, or central lift stations um, where, you, where you're generally collecting from, from many different stations all at once. Um, you know, Vaughn conditioning pumps are available as a stand mounted submersible. Um, and they will drop into the they will drop into the lift station um, on a stand. Uh, they provide mixing and solids management in a compact and efficient package. Um, so these can be these can be dropped in. They can be um, brought between uh, stations if necessary with a, with a quick disconnect uh, and, and multiple panels. Um, they're they're very uh, reliable for that. And uh, again, we typically design a target of six turnovers per hour. If you're looking for more information about list stations, I would definitely recommend that you uh, go to our education library and seek out our WIPES uh, presentation as there's a lot more information about list stations in particular. But I hope that was a good overview of, of why you might see mixing in list stations and, and what you're really designing for is, is just that reentrainment of floating mats, uh, layers, any large solids, uh, conditioning those and getting those so that they can be pumped out and moved on into the treatment process where you have either screening or, uh, or some sort of uh, sedimentation or, or um, clarifier basin. Uh, so now we'll talk about CSO basins. Um, and CSO basins may require mixing uh, generally to maintain capacity and reduce maintenance. Um, you know, CSO basins are, are defined by an intermittent usage. So you're really only going to use your CSO basin uh, when you have a high flow period. And for those of you that are in uh, separated sewer areas where you, where you don't have CSO, um, congratulations, you're lucky. Um, but for those of you that still are, are still have CSO basins and will for, for quite a while, um, you know, this is going to be a, uh, an ongoing issue for you. Um, and, and uh, you know, the intermittent usage really drives a, uh, a lot of maintenance. Um, you generally see rapid inflow and a slow metered outflow. And uh, the, the issue with that is everything's rushing in very quickly, very turbulent. It's carrying a lot of grit. It's carrying lots of solids, debris, um, anything that was washed into the storm sewers. And, uh, and then it's slow, and then it's being detained for, for a period of time, and then slowly metering out, which gives a lot of time for those things to settle out and, uh, and take away capacity and, uh, and really hamper the, the use of that system for the next storm event. Um, you know, grit and debris are really the main concerns for mixing design. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, the big difficulty with these, with these CSO basins is, is if you have to go in and clean them out, it's going to be a confined space generally. It's going to be a very expensive endeavor. You're going to have specialized equipment. It's, it's just a very expensive thing to have to do even on an intermittent basis. Um, so basin geometry weighs heavily on mixing performance with CSO basins. Uh, we recommend vertical shafts, or, or we prefer, I, I wouldn't say we're in a position to recommend what you have, but um, if I could, I would say vertical shafts are generally, we're going to outperform large shallow basins and the reason for that is the mixing design must sufficiently provide adequate velocity to spend grit and debris. And it must provide this across the entire area of the, of the floor of the, of the basin. You, you don't want to have mixing in one area and then have everything settle out in another. You're going to see long detention times generally, especially after large storm events. And you need to have, uh, you need to have some way of providing energy across that entire floor if you don't want to have deposition in, in certain areas. Um, so the larger that floor area is and that surface area is, uh, the more difficult that becomes. Um, CFD modeling can help determine mixing design for these. Uh, we generally, uh, you're going to hear that over and over again in this presentation, is CFD is really um, the way to go in terms of driving design um, for these systems because uh, everything is a little bit different. Everything's dealing with different fluid and, and really the technology has come a long way in providing um, a great uh, eye, eye to look at what is going to be the result of the design and, and helping clarify design decisions. 
Um, mixing flow must be distributed across the entire basin floor. And for vertical shafts, you know, mixing really only needs to be near the bottom uh, for most, in most cases. Uh, this picture on the right here is a, a big CSO tunnel. I think it was, it's about 100 feet deep. Um, but you can see in the bottom, you've got a, a mixing system that's washing that floor into a, into a, a small, a shallow um, a pump uh, uh, pit there that's got uh, dewatering pumps in it and in and, and a way to, to get grit out of that system. And so you're washing everything into that corner where the pumps can get at it and then pump it out so that you're cleaning that basin on each, each cycle. Um, and that's really an important thing. Um, grit and debris must have a pathway to exit the basin. And I think that's really key. Um, even if you've got a big, wide football field uh, that's, got, uh, um, that's got debris spread across it, uh, you, you need to have wherever your withdrawal point is, needs to be a low point. It needs to be an area where you can push the grit and debris to so that it actually has the ability to flow out. And you need to have enough velocity as it's flowing out to keep it carrying through the system, or you need to have some sort of ability to degrit and, and screen um, so that you're not uh, having that uh, stay either in the CSO basin or in your, uh, your, your piping onto your uh, facility. Uh, EQ basins. Uh, these are distinct from CSO basins due to their continuous usage. Um, generally, that's that's how I clarify between a CSO and EQ. Um, although you know there's probably exceptions, but uh, you know they generally operate within a normal range. Uh, you're going to see them equalizing flow into a facility. Uh, they may be pre or post headworks and screening, so you might have completely unscreened, unmitigated. Uh, waste waste flow that's coming into the EQ basin and then being metered into the facility, especially if the headworks is the limited the flow limiting uh, factor that's driving the need for an EQ basin, um, or you might see it post screening. And uh, you know, remember EQ basins are generally going to be before your primary sedimentation. So uh, and it, all your primary is still going to be in that fluid, and that's what's most uh, most readily settleable within your wastewater. So. You need to have good mixing to, to maintain distribution of that and make sure that you're not overloading your headworks, especially if your EQ basin is being driven by um, some sort of biological need, especially, uh, you know, let's say your pounds per day under aeration uh, limit is being exceeded. And so you're detaining some of your flow to help meter that, um, you know, that's something that if you're doing that, but then when you go to send stuff to the facility, you're sending very high concentrated uh, settled sludge. Um, you might overwhelm the system anyway and, and completely defeat the purpose. Um, mixing design must provide consistent loading to the treatment facility um, regardless though because you, the whole point of an EQ basin is to average things. And so when you're looking at mixing design, you want to be focused on providing a, a, a continuous mix that's going to continuously homogenize and blend and, and resuspend. And you're really kind of in between those two factors of, of homogenization and, and agitation and resuspension. Uh, they're both critical aspects of that design, and so they both need to be considered. Um, mixing design should provide for a modest condition EQ basin, uh, must be distributed to prevent stratification and settling, and uh, variable mixing energy may improve efficiency, which is the one, uh, one great thing about EQ basins is because you have the variable level and you have and your, your continuous mix, uh, you can vary that mixing energy based on what the tank level is and potentially to see quite a bit of savings, um, especially if you're running at a lower level in that EQ basin on more often than you're running at a high level, which tends to be typical because uh, obviously you don't want to be running all the time at your high level because then you have no capacity um, for, for any high flow times. So uh, definitely uh, definitely something that can provide some, some uh, efficiency in that design. Uh, sludge blend tanks. Uh, these are defined as, as blending various sludges together. So blend tanks blend. They receive uh, uh, multiple sludges and they blend them into one cohesive sludge that's homogenized and ready for whatever the next process is. They, they're always pre-digestion, but you know, as, the more I think about it, the more I think there are some exceptions to that um, with, with new treatment processes. Um, if you're only digesting your, your waste activated sludge and you're sending your primary, you're bypassing your digestion with your primary, uh, you might have a blend tank that's post digestion that's feeding a dewatering process. And that's something to be cognizant of because uh, blend tanks really have a different design than, uh, than a sludge storage tank. Uh, we'll, we'll get into that. 
Uh, they generally require the most mixing energy of any process, and the reason for that is they're generally seeing the highest concentration sludges of any process tank in your facility. Um, they're what's going to be receiving your, your thickened sludges, your waste-activated sludge, um, your primary, um, any additional sludges or, or waste streams that you're receiving, and they're going to be blending them together. And, and after the blend tank and digestion, um, you're going to have a digested sludge that's generally going to be less viscous, it's going to be a lower percent solids, and so any tertiary, tertiary processes past that are going to see, uh, are going to likely have uh, lower mixing requirements because they're not focused on blending, but they're also going to be uh, easier to mix because of the, the, less, uh, the lower solids concentration and the lower viscosity of the sludge. Um, depending on low cycle, load cycles, uh, you may see a large variation in sludge uh, characteristics. Um, so if you are not continuously feeding from all of the different sludge streams that you're feeding into your blend tank, you might have to periods of time where you've got higher concentrations of maybe thickened TWAs um, or, um, or various other uh, received sludges um, rather than maybe your thinner primary or other uh, thinner sludges. And, and that can change the, uh, what's the consistency of what's in the blend tank and the mixing energy needed to mix it. Um, you know, mixing design must provide for homogeneous feed to the digester dewatering. So if you don't have digestion and you're just blending for dewatering, or your post-digestion blending other sludges in to dewater, uh, your mixing needs to be homogenous to feed those two processes so that they can be most efficient. Uh, mixing design should account for your worst case sludge loading. So whatever you think your worst case is, uh, that needs to drive the design. Um, if you try to cut corners by designing for what you think the average condition will be or some, or, or some ideal condition, uh, you're probably going to end up with problems, and I've seen we've had systems that we've worked with with Rotomix where the design was for a blended sludge, but the process was was one or the other, and so when the thicker sludge entered the system, the mixing wasn't adequate, and you know that's a difficult problem to solve once it's installed. It's an easy problem to address in the design phase, um, so always uh, be be cognizant of of designing for your worst case scenario especially with, with wastewater um, streams because those generally are, on, are you're going to eventually see your worst case scenario. Uh, there's a lot of inconsistency in, in wastewater and, and loadings. And that's why, you know, when you look at the, uh, the safety factors for flow design and, and solids loading design, uh, they tend to be fairly large. Uh, CFD, again, can't harp on this enough. CFD can help determine mixing design and performance. And we'll talk, we'll talk at the end about what CFD can do um, but I just want to hammer that in on every every different process that, that, that at the end, CFD is going to drive a lot of your design decisions um, because it's the it's the most uh, accurate way of before anything's installed to determine what the system's going to look like in terms of performance. Uh, fog, you know, fat soil grease, high strength waste, septage receiving. Um, these are similar to blend tanks, uh, but with some key differences. Uh, they're generally smaller in size. Uh, 10 to 30 foot in diameter is generally what you'll see. Um, they tend to be standalone systems. Uh, they're generally batch processes, so you're offloading a truck, you're mixing, homogenizing, and then you're, you know, maybe you're taking uh, lab measurements, you're checking, you know, pH or some other other thing, and then once that's all cleared, you're sending it on into your uh, into your process, and uh, and maybe to a blend tank or maybe just directly to a digester. Um, your mixing design must provide for homogeneous feed to the next process. So if you're feeding to a blend tank, uh, you don't want to hit that with a slug of something nasty. You want to you want to try to blend it as much as you can. Make sure you're cycling through your batches, um, and then you want to make sure that that feed to that next process is is homogeneous. Especially if you're just dumping it straight into a digester, um, that's really where you're going to see problems um, if you don't have homogeneous feed, um, especially. Um, and then uh, we provide uh, externally mounted adjustable stainless steel nozzles uh, that can be mounted to the ex external piping of a tank. And these can be used especially for above ground small fabricated tanks, whether they're steel or poly. Um, you see an application here. Um, we have the ability to, to use the pump as a transfer pump and then also provide mixing once the transfer is complete. Uh, we can blend a condition received sludge prior to introducing into the sludge handling process. Um, and, and this is really only applicable to batch operation. If it's not a batch operation, you'll want to have separate uh, transfer and mixing pumps uh, so that you can maintain operational uh, continuity uh, throughout the process. But uh, you know, for, for facilities that are trying to maximize uh, 
energy efficiency or trying to limit capital expenditure because you know the, it's being driven by the, a, a want to either receive sludge as a, as a revenue stream or septage or some other thing as a revenue stream or whether it's uh, accepting high strength waste to feed a, a digestion process uh, to see value out of uh, renewable energy credits or some other um, value from biogas production. Uh, you know, being able to do these uh, in a small package that is as efficient as possible generally is going to help make those pencil better and is an important thing. Uh, we'll talk about sludge storage tanks now. Um, you can see these kind of everywhere in the facility uh, but they're, they're, and, and in other processes, but they're distinct from blend tanks. And the reason why is they're, only, they're generally only receiving a single source sludge, and in most cases that's going to be digestate. Um, it, might be, uh, it might be, you know, various chemical wastes, various uh, manure wastes. Um, you know, it could be you've got uh, separate primary and waste-activated sludge tanks in a, in a wastewater facility. It could be uh, lime, lime slurry or, or lime sludge from a, waste, from a water facility or, or even a wastewater facility if you're using lime for some uh, filtration purpose uh, on your effluent. Um, you know, there's various reasons why you'll store sludges in various processes, um, but they're always going to be distinct from blend tanks because, because they're only, you're only receiving one sludge or one source sludge. And so you're not fo focused on blending, you're just focused on keeping it in suspension. And that's really your lowest energy design point. And so sludge storage is really key to, to separate because it's going to tell you if you can identify which uh, tanks are blending, you can identify when you're going to need more energy. And then sludge storage, you can in separate sludge storage, you can make sure you're not putting too much energy and you're being efficient in your design. Uh, these are generally post-digestion, but not always. And it's important to differentiate. Um, mixing design will depend on sludge source, uh, source sludge characteristics. Uh, they're generally variable level tanks, so again, you might be able to see energy savings by varying the mixing energy. Um, but with sludge storage, it tends to be better to just operate in an on-off configuration rather than varying the mixing energy um, because you're really being driven by the energy requirements to resuspend, and that's generally not going to change based on level. And so an on-off operation is probably the better scheme uh, for these systems. Uh, mixing design must prevent deposition and dewatering. Uh, that's, that's the key. Um, and sludge storage feeding dewatering equipment may require more mixing energy. And if you're feeding dewatering equipment from sludge storage, you almost want to treat it like a blend tank because, again, you're trying to homogenize so that you're getting consistent feed to that dewatering process so that you're getting good cake, good cake generation. Um, and, that, and that process is consistent. And that's where you're really going to see your savings. So uh, sludge storage feeding dewatering uh, might have different needs than just general sludge storage. Uh, but that's something you can weigh as you look at your design. Um, and, you know, always remember, you know, even digested sludge, uh, you know, when you look at textbooks for uh, anaerobic lagoons or long-term uh, detention ponds, uh, if you leave solids without mixing for a decent amount of time, they will dewater to about 30% solids. And at that level of solids, the only way you're getting it out is with a backhoe. Um, so it's really something to consider. Um, especially as sludge storage tanks are being driven by a uh, lack of disposal ability uh, for a lot of different facilities as land application becomes more and more regulated. Uh, it's always something to keep in mind. Uh, talk a little bit about the role of CFD in design. Uh, computational fluid dynamics can model the mixing system design. It's the most dependable way to model mixing system uh, design performance. Uh, we have the ability to model unique tank geometry and sludge rheology. Um, and the ability to perform simulated tracer dispersion and washout analyses, depending on what the process is. You know, for a blend tank, uh, tracer dispersion is going to tell you if I add something to this tank uh, from some process, how quickly is this going to be blended into this into this uh, sludge? Um, it's something that uh, that really can provide a uh, a lot of in depth analysis into what the performance of the system is going to be before it's even built, which is is generally not always been possible. Um, and you can validate all your CFD by field testing. Uh, you know, you can design your CFD analysis to output a, output a condition that you can then test whether the physical reality matches up with that after it's been built and, and back validate that initial design and make sure it's operating as, as needed. Um, I'll talk a little bit about impacts of sludge rheology and how they impact CFD. I used the word rheology earlier, so for those that aren't aware, rheology is the study of fluid flow. Um, and in this case, uh, focus mostly on non-Newtonian uh, fluids that have varying uh, shear, uh, shear rates. Uh, viscosity depends by shear rate. 
Um, so for lower shear rates, uh, lower shear, you're going to see higher uh, viscosity and, and uh, reaction to that shear. And then as you move out to higher shear rates, uh, you see that that flow start to uh, start to lower in viscosity and, and sort of become much more malleable. Um, it's important to the accuracy of CD, CFD analysis and therefore mixing design. Uh, you can see from zero to two uh, shear rate, uh, you have a lot of variation. And based on different sludges, you have a lot of variation in what that viscosity is. And that's going to change the efficiency of your mixing and how much energy you need to impart to get the same amount of mixing uh, in different sludges. Uh, there's significant variability in characteristics of common sludges, as you can see. And we have the ability to model multiple sludge characteristics in a single analysis. So we can define uh, various feeds of different sludges with different rheologies and, and analyze how those are going to play with each other, how they're going to blend together, whether you're going to see stratification of those two species, uh, species being the term for different fluids in an analysis. And you can, uh, you can kind of get an idea of how these things are going to play with each other um, if you're if you're looking at something that's going to see multiple different uh, different feeds and and you can even look at different cases, um, there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, some other considerations uh, to talk about uh, with respect to uh, mixing these tanks. Uh, I want to talk about inflow and outflow design. Uh, this is not something that is generally part of the mixing, uh, but definitely uh, impacts the performance of the system. Uh, you need to have good mixing at the inflow. So wherever sludge or uh, or waste water is feeding into the system, you need to have good mixing so that if if you're get, receiving something that's concentrated or you're getting a big slug of something, that you're rapidly dispersing that and averaging the system to make sure that the mixing is performing as needed. Uh, overflows act as clarifiers. Um, and so on the other side, on the overflow side, if you are completely relying on overflows to de to dewater or to remove sludge from a from a basin or a tank, um, you got to remember that that overflow is going to act as a clarifier. It's going to want to uh, select for low uh, low weight fluid, and so if you have heavier solids, if you have grit, if you have debris that's that's heavier um, than the average uh, the average weight of the sludge you're mixing, you're going to see that start to separate out. You're going to see that start to sit in the lower region of the tank, you can keep it off the bottom with good mixing, but you're not going to get out of the system and it's eventually going to overwhelm the system uh, as it collects. Uh, so if you have an overflow design, it may be, you can either look at changing that to a withdrawal point, or you can look at adding a withdrawal point and going between the two uh, to make sure that you're removing uh, things from collecting in the system. Uh, and I would recommend a withdrawal point near the bottom in the center, especially if you've got even a shallow cone. I mean, steep cones, absolutely, bottom near the center. That's where everything's going to want to collect. But even with a shallow cone or a flat floor, generally things want to move towards the middle and migrate towards the middle. And that's going to be your best withdrawal point to make sure that you're removing as much as possible and keeping things moving through your facility. Uh, and then flexibility. Uh, I saw a couple questions and what people were looking to learn from this in terms of uh, what, the, what changing a tank is going to mean for them in terms of their mixing. And, you know, really, you want to be looking at future facility expansion. You know, is this process going to change? Um, you know, a lot of the, these mixing systems, especially Von Rotomix, uh, Von Rotomix comes with a 10-year prorated warranty on the nozzles. Uh, so this system is going to be there for a long time and, and probably a lot longer than that. You might get 20, 25 years out of these systems. Uh, so, what is, you know, I know you've got a 30-year facility plan. Where are you going to be? Um, in 30 years, and, and do you expect to be changing the use of this tank? And can we look at that so that we have the ability to make to drive that into the design so that when you make those changes, you don't have this new additional capital cost of replacing everything and, and relaying out piping and all that stuff uh, that maybe you could save by, by being a little bit more for, foresightful with your, with your design? Um, and then is conversion a possibility? Um, if is it going to be converted? Uh, do you have a, a sludge storage tank uh, that you're building now that you intend to convert to a secondary digester? Um, are you looking at adding uh, adding a THP process or thermal hydrolysis uh, sludge process? Um, and is that going to change what your blend and storage tank configuration looks like before your digestion? Um, you know, those are all things that you could, should consider um, because they might change. Uh, what your what your design looks like, or how your system should should be laid out uh, to get provide you that flexibility. And the more you broach that in your initial design, 
uh, the better off you'll head um, future headaches by, by making sure that you're, you're providing something that is flexible for your customer or, 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 building, or, or um, building something in your facility that is flexible for your future operational needs. Um, and and that, that particular issue doesn't just apply to municipal, it applies to, um, you know, if you're an industrial uh, facility and you're potentially going to be, um, you're potentially going to be uh, converting or, or adding to or improving uh, your, your waste stream management because of regulatory issues or you expect to be doing that or you expect to be taking on a new uh, waste stream from a new um, expansion of, of a plant, you want to have that flexibility built in and consider that in your design. Um, it's, it's very important. Um, so in summary, uh, non-digesters are an important part of wastewater treatment in the sludge handling process. Uh, they're physical processes with physical design criteria. Advancement in CFD are allowing for more detailed uh, design of mixing systems. And good mixing design promotes efficiency and process reliability. And, and that's really what we're all trying to do. We're trying to provide enough mixing to make sure that we don't have problems. And if, if you can prevent a problem and maintain efficient and reliable operation, um, that's the goal always. So um, I hope that was very inform informational. Uh, we've got one more slide. I'm going to kick this back to Steve. He's going to talk a little bit about why you should consider Rotomix for your projects, and then we'll get into questions. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Steve, you I'm still there? Thanks, Eric. Okay, so I guess we'll, we've been down the weeds a little bit. I'm going to take it back to a higher level and just bring it back to what we said in the very beginning. You know, through all the details uh, that Eric mentioned, um, we still want you to know that, you know, Vaughn has the knowledge, the experience to work with you on your particular application to define and to design and optimize, you know, whatever mixing process you have um, based on your unique situation. You've got certain amount of capital available, you've got you know, operational flexibility that you need, you've got reliability requirements, long-term reliability that you need. Um, so all the technical features of our Rotomix system, the pumps, uh, the nozzles, they're all there intentionally. Um, they're purpose-built and improved upon over the years iteratively to, to perform in the most aggressive and challenging mixing environments. So to do that, um, you know, reliably. So we have thousands of installations, as I mentioned at the beginning, in, in the CFD modeling, and that's all to give you the assurances that you need to, uh, to bring us into your conversation. Um, you know, beyond all that, we really love what we do, and uh, we, have, we have fun doing it. So I do think that we're going to transition over to some questions and answers um, at this time to engage with you all. So Stephanie and Scott, are you all ready for that? You bet. All right. Well, thanks, Steve. Thanks, uh, Eric, for lots of great content here. We've uh, we've got lots of uh, we've got some good questions back here, and a whole bunch of resources that we'll talk through in a minute as well. We just want to remind everybody Q and A. That's uh, you just drop the questions right there below the slide, um, and uh, we'll answer them. We've got some few. We've got a few already in here. And then also on the screen, there's lots of resources here. We've got a list of videos that relate to what we talked about today. We've got some download files on the left-hand side. And then also um, a number of other resources linked to our video page, the home page. Stephanie talked earlier about uh, future webinars that are coming up, as well as if you'd like a certificate for participation, if you just click right there where it says Participant Certificate and then click Browse To, that'll take you open up another window and you'll be able to continue to hear what we're talking about, but also uh, just fill out that form and we'll get you, you'll be able to download a certificate from there. So, all right, Stephanie, I think we've got a few questions here. Why don't you go ahead and get started? All right, sounds great. Uh, thanks again for everybody that joined us. Um, let's get to these questions. So Matt um, is asking, in a rectangular basin digester, does the mixing pump need to run all the time, or could it be run periodically to break up deposits? Yeah, so <clears throat> in a, it, as the question specifically relates to a digester, um, generally I'm gonna, I would recommend that a digester be mixing all the time, although um, for those that uh, tuned in for our previous uh, Rotomix presentation that talked about digestion, um, you know, you might have varying energy based on the, the biological versus physical uh, process needs. Uh, but I would, I would generally, you'd want to provide mixing uh, continuously uh, to break, uh, to continue to, uh, you know, as the biomass produces uh, pH concentrations, as it provides, as, as it creates uh, biogas that needs to come out of suspension, 
Um, you're going to want to have mixing to to help drive those processes and, and create efficiency. Um, and you know, although it wasn't asked, I'll, I'll touch on something. Uh, rectangular basins in general um, are going to require uh, greater mixing just because of the turbulent nature. Um, you're not going to get steady state flow in a rectangular basin because it's not symmetric geometry. And so you're going to have a much larger shear plane in, in the mixing flow uh, that's going to, that's going to uh, you know, work, that's going to dissipate the mixing energy pretty quickly. And so you're generally going to need to input more mixing energy to maintain mixing. Uh, so, so rectangular basins in general are going to, are going to require more mixing. Uh, but for certain processes, you might want that additional turbulence. So, um, you know, they're not necessarily always uh, the worst decision. Okay, um, we've got a question from Vin. He's asking um, about the turnover for dairy cow or manure, um, and, and of course depending on bedding and total solids percentage, but asking if in general any different than municipal lift station. Um, I would say it's different. Uh, for, for dairy cow manure, um, it depends on the size, uh, but you really, I think the, the issue with turnover is if you're designing off of turnover, you're, you're, you're making a decision that every single uh, every single tank is going to be the same, and so you can apply the same design metric to every single tank. And I think the, the key takeaway I want people to have is that not every tank is going to be the same. Even dairy cow manure is going to have a large amount of variability depending on the, the dairy it's at and how uh, the manure is getting into that tank or basin. Um, so generally, what I would recommend is is looking at um, how what is the what is the geometry of the tank. What is, what is the concentration of the dairy manure? Um, get some more data and then, and then try, to, uh, try to dive into what the mixing energy is. And that will drive, your, that'll drive what your turnover should be. That will drive what your mixing flow should be. Um, it, and so th I think it's where you want to really look at how much energy do I need to put in. And where turnover is not going to necessarily tell you that energy number, which, which is really what's driving the design, is how much mixing energy you need. Um, I know that's probably a roundabout question, but I, it's why we really push the CFD because um, we can drive down to what is that mixing energy requirement, and and you know that will drive decisions about what turnover is because uh, turnover will change depending on the tank and the, and the process and the manure. All right, um, Clint is asking um, the options for adding air along with mixing for sludge storage applications. Yeah, so, uh, so sludge storage, especially um, if it is active sludge, uh, whether it's waste activated sludge um, or it's uh, or digested sludge, um, you're going to see uh, continued uh, digestion. Uh, you know, that biomass is going to wash out to some extent with whatever you're wasting. Um, and so if you need to provide air to, to maintain oxygen so that you don't see that go septic or, uh, become, or start uh, fixing sulfur, uh, for odor issues, uh, definitely adding air can, can solve those problems. Um, and I think what's con been conventional is when, you've when people have added air, uh, they've used the air to mix as well. Um, but adding air is expensive from an energy standpoint. And so if you can reduce adding air to just what's needed for the biological need, um, that definitely can save you some, some, some costs uh, by having the mixing energy be, be provided through something like Rotomix. And so uh, we definitely would recommend uh, looking into that as an option, and we will happily work with uh, an aeration provider uh, to separate out what is the what is the aeration requirement and what is the mixing requirement from an energy standpoint. And if if the aeration requirement is is suitably low enough that it makes sense to have both aeration and, and mixing equipment, um, that's a case that uh, you know I think we can we can make sense. Of, of doing that uh, from a capital and installation standpoint. And, you know, we've really seen that uh, even for the most uh, most aggressive applications like aerobic digesters, uh, generally the, the aeration compared to the mixing is low enough that uh, it makes sense to have a separate mixing uh, system. Although uh, we, we'd like to uh, work on uh, getting more and more applications for that, but we have several um, existing facilities that are, that are operating in that way. And are seeing a, a pretty good uh, capital uh, long-term savings on their uh, present-day costs. Okay, Thomas is asking if the slide presentations will be available to attendees, and I can answer that one. Um, these um, 
webinars are being recorded. Um, you can access this and all previously recorded uh, webinars at chopperpumps.com forward slash, slash education, and they are also available on our Vaughn YouTube page. Uh, we should have that up. Um, the, today's presentation should be available uh, by tomorrow afternoon. Um, and, and as I said, um, all previous uh, webinars that we've done over the past month um, are also on the Vaughn Education page. Um, if we did I'll, I'll, oh. If we did not get to your question today, uh, just know that somebody will be in contact with you soon to discuss and answer your uh, the additional questions that we were unable to get to today. And I just want to add, uh, if if you know, it sounds like the question is is potentially wanting to provide those slides to to people who weren't able to attend. Um, you know, if you have uh, people who weren't able to attend, or you have a group that's interested in, in having this presentation, uh, we can work to make this available as a, as a private presentation and, and maybe even touch on specific topics related to a project you may have or information uh, d depending on uh, time and, and availability. So, so always reach out to us. We're more than happy to, uh, to work with you. Eric, I just got, I got another question sent over to me. Um, Derek would like to talk about this. So for anaerobic digestion applications, yep. do you have manure macerating grinding with mixing options that minimize the amount of air entrained into the homogenized waste stream entering the anaerobic digester? Do you want me to, is Derek going to take that or do you want me to take it? Yes, Eric, please. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, so the Vaughn chopper pump uh, integrally chops and uh, breaks down solids, um, and so if you're using that uh, for transferring manure into a digest, an anaerobic digester, um, that's definitely a, a way to do it. Um, you're not going to entrain any air through using uh, that pump, um, and uh, so I, I don't see how that would uh, how that would entrain any air. I'm guessing, uh, you know. Positive displacement or uh, progressive cavity pumps, uh, you might be able to entrain some air uh, because of, because of how those pumps operate, or or even uh, plunger pumps or some other uh, some other pump. Uh, but yeah, using a von chopper pump will help to break that down. It's integral to the pump, the the breakdown and the grinding and 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 chopping, and uh, will help uh, minimize any air entrainment and really provide a conditioned solid into that uh, anaerobic digester application. All right. Looks like uh, we're almost at the end here. Give you guys one last chance to drop in any questions that you have. Lots of resources and materials on the screen. Um, access to the website, participant certificate, um, five or so different videos that take us back out to the YouTube page from Vaughn, um, and then uh, half a dozen different files and resources. Some great case studies out here, Rotomix brochure, and um, and then an area to share, uh, we'd love to hear what else you'd like to do um, in terms of webinar topics. Um, we're always looking to uh, provide that content. And Eric's got some great resources and knowledge and already excited to get into the, to the indigestion one, um, which is not our next webinar. We've got one more webinar on the 2nd, but then on June 16th, we've got dealing with indigestion. Hope everybody can join us there. All right, looks like um, the question department is, uh, we're going to close that up. Steve, any last comments there? No comments here. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for coming, everyone. All right. Thanks, Steve. Eric? Yeah, no, I had a great time. It's always fun to present uh, this information to everybody. I hope it was useful, and I look forward to seeing everybody on my next two webinars that I'll be directly involved in, which will be uh, dealing with indigestion and foaming at the mouth. And uh, those will kind of dive into the d digestion side of things, which uh, this presentation was really anti-digestion, more focused on everything else, which, um, you know, I think digesters sometimes get too much attention. <laughs> 
That's great. Thanks, everybody. And um, with that, we'll uh, we'll close things down. If you guys have any more questions that we didn't get to today, either you posted them in here or you're listening to this as a recording, um, just email us at info at chopperpumps.com, and uh, anyone in the Vaughn team will get back to you. And uh, once again, our next webinar uh, focused right around Rotamix is uh, June 16th, dealing with indigestion. So you can find this webinar and all the other ones, um, new ones and past at chopperpumps.com slash education. With that, we'll call it good. Thanks, everybody, for joining us, and we'll see you next time.